All right, good morning and happy Sabbath. Welcome to our Bible study, our reflective Bible study this morning, where we will be, we will be discussing ministering like Jesus. We are so excited that you have taken the time this All right, morning. Good morning and happy Sabbath. Well, we are so happy that you have taken the time this morning to come and join us for our Bible study. We will have a time of reflection together where we will be talking about ministering like Jesus. And we have some exciting panelists who will be joining us today. We have Elder Gabriel Baptiste, Dr. Cherie Caleb, and Mrs. Sonia Paul. And as we reflect on this, before we get further in our lesson, we want to have a, a prayer. So please join us wherever you are as we ask Jesus to join us in our Bible study this morning. Dear Heavenly Father, we know that there's so much turbulence going on in the world around us. We're living in times of viral uncertainty, fires are burning in California, and all around us, people are left with, with doom and doubt and just fear. But we know, Lord, that when we go to the rock, the hope of our salvation, that we can find joy and eternal life in your word. So as we have time together today and talk about how we can minister like you, come into the midst of our Bible discussion this day, infuse us with your love so that when our time of study is over, we can then empower those that come into our, come into our existence or come into our presence with your love and we can reflect your character and your joy and your grace. In the name of Jesus, we pray, amen. 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 All right. So this week's lesson is so rich and so exciting. When I was a child, we used to sing a song in our family worship called I Would Be Like Jesus. And it started off something with earthly pleasures vainly call me. I would be like Jesus. And the chorus says, be like Jesus is my song in the home and in the throng. Be like Jesus all day long. I would be like Jesus. Mm -hmm. So that's the thrust of our discussion this week, being like Jesus. So Cherie, will you go ahead and read our memory verse for this week? I don't see it, so I'm gonna go ahead and pull it up. Oh, okay. Oh, that's true. I could go to the next slide. Let's do that. But when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion for them because they were weary and scattered like sheep having no shepherd. Matthew 9, 36. Okay, thank you, Cherie. Uh, some of you may be wondering, how on earth can I take part in the study? How can I get the lessons ahead of time? And so we wanted to make sure you know that you can see these lessons online at A B S G dot adventist.org. So during the week, you can take a time to download those lessons. Cherie has read our memory verse for this week. And read it one more time, Cherie, so we can just let this marinate in us. Okay. But when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion for them because they were weary and scattered like sheep having no shepherd. Matthew 9, 36. Thank you. Amen. This shows us the compassion and the love of Jesus. He was moved with compassion because they were weary and scattered. Kind of how we are in 2020 right now. Think about the world. We're scattered. We're weary. People feel like there's a loss of direction. And there's a little picture of a little sheep right here hiding behind a tree. And in his eyes, he looks so lonely and so just alone. And Jesus is here to say, I have compassion. I'm here. I am the ultimate shepherd to guide and to cheer. So we want to continue with this discussion about seeing, you know, Jesus had a great attitude. He had a wonderful, wonderful attitude. There it is. He had a great attitude. And so in our discussion now, we want to have um, our panelists talk about uh, Jesus as it's reflected in John 17, 15 to 18. And what it means to say that Jesus prayed and that his followers would be in the world, but not of the world. Cherie, tell us, share your thoughts with us. What does that mean? 
Sure. So to me, this means that Jesus was essentially praying for us to be like him. Uh, Jesus came to the world, lived in the world, but was not of the world. Um, he was able to accomplish this through the help of his father. And so we are to be the same with the help, ask for God's help to be in the world and not of the world. And I think to me, this means um, having, being able to live amongst others in the world who may not have an understanding of spiritual things, being able to relate to them, love them, teach them, help them, while still maintaining a love and respect for God and without compromising our own Christian values. Amen. 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 Powerful answer there, Cherie. What about Elder Baptiste? Yes, um, this metaphor of being in the world, but not of the world, this example comes to mind. I share workspace with um, various guys from different parts of the world. And all throughout the day, or particularly during lunchtime, they swap videos. They jest and, you know, make laugh and probably enjoy the unsavory material that brings them pleasure. Uh, so they turn to each other, showing whatever appeals to them, but they don't share it with me. <laughs> it's obvious. Uh, I don't share their value. And so I'm like a sore thumb. Well, that's a good thing because I probably won't enjoy it anyway. So this exemplifies being in the world, but not part of the world. You don't share the value system of the world. And the world in that inference really is the uncircumcised heart or the unconverted nature. And we don't share the value system that is existent out there. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, powerful. Mrs. Paul. Yes. Um, it is my belief that Christians are in the world to influence for Christ to influence the world for Christ. However, when the world is in, Christ, in the Christian, absorbing all their time, something is definitely wrong. The Bible is explicit and it says in Matthew 6, 24, you cannot serve God and man, or in this case, the world. No man can have two masters for either he will hate the one and love the other. Mm, mm, powerful. Now, do any of you have a particular story where you may have felt um, that you were in the world, but not of the world? Does anything come to mind? In my youth, as a very young Seventh-day Adventist, I no longer did those things that are displeasing to God such as living outside my Sabbath absorb, ob, observation. I understood fully that the Sabbath hours existed from sunset to sunset. I believe Jesus was praying that even though we are often of the world, he was soliciting his prayers that we be protected from the evil in the world. Amen, amen. Thank you so much for sharing. Thank you so much for sharing. And as we continue in our discussion today, we learned that Jesus saw the best and he brought out the best in people. Think about that for a minute. I think it's Marvin Sapp that has a song, he saw the best in me. Yes. And so if we're trying to be like Jesus in our homes and at work and the supermarket, that means that 24 seven, we are mandated to try to see the best in people and to bring out the best in people. That's, that's a big challenge. But because Jesus came on earth to minister and to be our example, it gives us this divine hope and this divine inspiration that if he can do it, we have the faith that he can empower us to be like him, amen? Yeah. And yes. so let's look at 
how Jesus saw the best in people. And we want to look at stories where you were tried to witness, but maybe it went south and because of how we may have said it. I, you know, for example, sometimes we, we all love hearing testimonies, at least I do. And every now and then you'll hear a testimony where someone says, you know, they were at a potluck and they saw someone eating something and they knocked the plate out of their hand because they knew that they should not be eating what was on that plate. And I actually did hear a pastor uh, share a sermon about this where he got calls that, wow. you know, some a member had done something like this, not in our church, of course, but somewhere on the planet <laughs> in the world, somewhere this event took place. And people, the person thought they were doing a good thing. You know, it was something about cheese and they were convicted that they shouldn't eat cheese. But when someone else, a new convert brought cheese to a potluck, they actually threw the dish away. And how do you think that made that member feel, you know, who's bringing cheese? So I think, and you have to look, would Jesus have done it that way? You know, and I know some of you are probably laughing like cheese, really, but <laughs> you'd be surprised. You'd be surprised. So I'd like you all to share a story, um, you know, where something might have gone wrong. And we're looking at the statement that came out of the lesson where truth is truth and people need to take it or leave it. What can be wrong with that statement? Okay, we'll start with, with Sonia Paul again. Okay, I, as an undisciplined mind, I accept truth as factual belief. Uh, this type of truth leaves us straddling the fence and encourages us to take it or leave it. Regardless of this belief, we are to live our lives to be an example to those looking on. We're to show what is truth. We are to live our lives to be an example to others by living honestly and positively reflecting Christ in all that we do and say. Amen, amen. All right, we'll go to Cherie. So um, I think what's wrong with that statement, truth is truth and people can take it or leave it, um, is that we have to be sensitive to where people are in their walk. Yes. Um, where they are spiritually, mentally, emotionally, physically, uh, it may be different from where we are, and they may not be in a in a place to receive the word that we have to give. So that requires being prayerful and asking God for spiritual discernment, yes. and being perceptive, and sometimes being and being flexible and bending where we need to, and not always uh, pushing so hard to just get our point across, but being able to listen to other people and where and where they are and meet them there like Jesus did. And something that, I guess an example that I can think of is in my profession as a physician, I have to, I, I will sometimes see a patient who comes in to talk to me about one issue, say their shoulder hurts. But in my discussion with them, I perceive that there's something else that is really bothering them. Maybe the stress of their job, maybe the loss of a loved one. And we end up taking the conversation in that direction and addressing the hurt they're experiencing emotionally that has nothing to do with their physical pain. And at the end of the visit, they perceive that their need has been met because we addressed the underlying issue. So I'm trying to meet them where they are and address the underlying need and they walk away feeling encouraged. And so I just, that came to mind as I was thinking of the, of the question that you asked, um, meeting people where they are, I think that can go a long way. Amen, amen. And the lesson does highlight this because part of Jesus's ministry on earth, he demonstrated such a true and noble compassion to people that when he looked in their eyes and spoke love and compassion and understanding and grace directly in their eyes, they knew there was something different about him. He didn't have an ulterior motive that he wanted to take them into a better place, a place of peace, a place of comfort. And so when he was able to show that love, that grace, that, that blessed peace, then they were more open and able to receive the spiritual teachings that he had for them. And so it was a wonderful um, 
message in, in ministry. And so we're going to go now to Elder Baptiste, who will give us his answer to that same question. Yes. While humanity see the glass always half empty, Jesus sees it half full. Yes, <laughs> it is true. I am a thief. It is true that I am covetous. It is true that I break the Sabbath. It is true. I am guilty of all of the above, but I don't need to be reminded of that every time. And so when Jesus sees me, he sees what I can become in him. So mm -hmm. all of the truth of the matter that I stink, <laughs> I am worse of all people, but Jesus sees what I can become when his grace is applied to my life. Amen. 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 Well, it's, it's time to take it to the streets. This has become one of my favorite segments in our Bible study, for we know that we have four pan well, three panelists and a moderator on today, but there's so many of you out there listening. And so for those of you who are taking time to comment on Facebook and YouTube, we're going to take a few seconds just to look at these comments. Many of you are wishing us a Shabbat Shalom, and some of you are saying Happy Sabbath. So right back at you. We're glad you took the time to worship with us and to study God's word. Um, we have someone saying um, from Aro Motive Studio, truth isn't always simple or clear. That is true. Sometimes it looks kind of gray, like Elder Baptiste pointed out, is the glass half full or is it half empty? Yes. I tell my kids that all the time. If I held up a quarter and I show it to them and I say, okay, tell me, what do you see? Someone may say, I see the head. Someone says they see the tail. Someone else just sees the ridges on the quarter. Who's lying? Who's telling the truth? So we do see that. And that's where we pray for the Holy Spirit to come into us and to convict us and to help guide us into truth and to guide us into light. Thank you for that comment. Dwight Palmer says, oftentimes we act out of anger when someone does something wrong. Christ was on the cross and he looked up and said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. He encourages us, Dwight is saying, to display empathy first in order to win souls. And Victoria Latke says, my daily goal is to see the best in people. Okay. Amen. Amen. Seeing the best in people. And that's a nice segue to our next topic on Jesus's treatment of people. If we want to see the best in people, it's good that we look at kind of how Jesus treated people because we said that he, he saw the best in people. So then, like Cherie mentioned, ministry of healing. Jesus had the ultimate ministry of healing. And we're going to ask Elder Baptiste to read Matthew 9, 1 through 7. Yes, the word of the Lord reads. So he got into a boat, crossed over, and came to his own city. And behold, they brought to him a paralytic lying on a bed. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, Son, be of good cheer, your sins are forgiven you. And at once, some of the scribes said within themselves, This man blasphemes. But Jesus, knowing their thoughts, said, Why do you think evil in your heart? For which is easier to say, your sins are forgiven you, or to say, arise and walk, but that you may know that the Son of Man has power on earth to forgive sin. Then he said to the paralytic, arise, take up your bed, and go to your house. Amen. 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 Okay, Sonia, why don't you read Mark uh, 5, 25 to 34. Okay. And a certain woman which had an issue of blood 12 years and had suffered many things of many physicians and had spent all that she had and was nothing bettered, but rather grew worse. When she had heard of Jesus, came in the press behind and touched his garment. For she said, if I may touch his clothes, but his clothes, I shall be made whole. And straight away, the fountain of her blood was dried up. And she felt in her body that she was healed of that plague. And Jesus immediately knowing in himself that virtue had gone out of him, turned about him and 
in the press and said, who touched my clothes? And the disciples said unto him, thou seest the multitude thronging thee and sayest, who touched my, <laughs> who touched me? And he looked round about to see her that had done this thing. But the woman fearing and trembling, knowing what had done, what was done in her came to him and fell down before him and told him all the truth. And he said unto her, daughter, thy faith hath made thee whole. Go in peace and be whole of thy plague. Amen. Amen. If that doesn't give you goosebumps, oh, yeah. that's something to yeah. shout about. If I can just touch the hem, the of hem his of his garment, what faith, people, what faith, brothers and sisters, this woman had. And also as a physician, I've always liked to think that maybe she had uterine fibroids or something that made her just have a wicked menstrual cycle. You know, the Bible stands every test we give it. Its author is divine. And they're really, everything that we're going through in 2020, we can definitely find some type of linkage in those 66 books of our Bible. So it pays to study God's word because through the Holy Spirit, we will be led into light and into truth. If I can just touch the hem of his garment. What is going on in your life today, brothers and sisters, where you just want to reach out and touch the hem of his garment? What issue is holding you down and, and, and downtrodden? Where have you put all of your resources, your money, and you just want to reach out and touch the hem of his garment? But then the story goes on to say that he stopped it was just a hem. It was just a thread. And God, Jesus, Jesus stopped. He felt, he felt her touching the hem, a little piece of thread. Mm. And he stopped in the midst of this magnificent multitude. Doesn't that give you hope and joy knowing that you are important and that you have value? And this, you have to look at biblical times. This was a woman. And in the ancient biblical times, women were not on the top of the, the, the totem pole for respect and for dignity and, and honor. And here Jesus shows people how to re respect and honor a woman. He did it with the woman at the well. He does it with this woman at the issue of blood. He stopped in the middle of what he was doing. So panelists, how do these stories show us that Jesus linked physical healing with meeting the ultimate need for reconciliation with God? Cherie, go ahead and share your thoughts with us. Sure. Um, so I think both of these stories speak to the fact that Jesus went about healing people physically as a means to ultimately uh, win, win their soul, as, as a means to uh, heal them spiritually. I think a lot of times when people have physical ailments, myself included, we want to go somewhere and talk to somebody who's going to make this thing better. And uh, if that person or if that somebody is Jesus um, and they're able to um, find a solution to meet our need, to make us feel better, then we are more receptive to hearing other things that they may have to share in this case, the love of Jesus. And so um, I, that's what Jesus did. I think that's what we as Christians are called to do individually and then as a, as a church as well. Amen, amen. And uh, let's see, what kind of initiatives can our church take in our community to meet people's needs and demonstrate that we really care for them? Sonia, what are your thoughts? Well, I, I realize that um, through our and, and I'm going to women's ministry, of course, because um, the initiatives that we can take uh, now that America, Americans are on a healthy kick, the church, the churches may offer uh, health clinics followed by cooking classes and stimulate interest by creating a local women's league or even a community sunshine ministry where we spread God's love through perhaps greeting cards, even creating a forum for women to exchange ideas. There are so many things that we can do for our communities. These are just a few ways of 
for total member involvement. Amen. Amen. And then Elder Baptiste, could you share a story where you were able to meet an individual's needs and what impact do you think your ability to meet their need had on their life? Yes, um, there was a friend, a friend of mine had a friend whom I did not know, hadn't met him yet, but um, he needed somewhere to live. And I threw open my doors, we threw open our doors to him, he came in and guess what? He loved what he saw, <laughs> the influence of the home. We integrated him as a member of the family, put his food, give him, gave him a premier seat at the table. And guess what? He's still a member of Seabrook. <laughs> wow. He Amen. trusts Amen. God that we serve, and he's a member of Seabrook, vibrant and strong. Another short story. Um, when I was a student at the university. I was broke. I'm always broke. And um, <laughs> when I, I, instead of being sorry, feeling sorry for myself, I went into the community and I was just visiting other folks and you know, just telling them about God's love. And incidentally, throughout a dialogue, a gentleman came to realize that I'm in dire straits. I'm in need. And he said, come with me took me to the store and he, tell, he told me, shop to your heart's content. I bought a, a bag of bread, I think some cheese and a juice. And that, he said, that's it? Yeah, I said, that's it. And guess what? He gave me some pocket change. I will never forget this kindness. And as a matter of fact, as a result of this kindness shown to me, my heart is softened when students are in dire straits. And I'm supporting many causes around the world um, where Maranatha, Adra, wherever they are building school, educating children, because education is the key to unlocking the myriads of possibilities out there. It's the key that open doors. So, like the Bible says, cast your bread upon the waters, and after many days, it will come back to you. And it has come back to me in full circle. Amen. Amen, Elder Baptiste. Well, we're going to take it to the streets. We're going to go back and see some of these comments. One that stood out to me is, um, you know, our own elder uh, brother, Gerald Thomas. He lost his brother, and he's writing from Cleveland saying that he's there preparing for his brother's services, but he took time to fellowship with his family. So he thanks us, the Seabrook family for the prayers. Let's continue to lift him up. And we should also remember Kimberly Allgood, who lost her sister uh, two days ago or this week. There are people hurting in our congregation and in our church family, and we want you to know we love you. We're praying for you. We can't be there to give you physical hugs, but know that we're sending you virtual hugs and that we're praying that the Holy Spirit will send a comforter blanket to just be with you all during this time of, of uncertainty and a time of sorrow. And we're just with you all. We have some other comments coming from Everlyn, Everlyn Fisher. She says, good morning, brother Thomas. Even though you're far away for the burial of your beloved brother, you will get to see family and friends. May your brother rest in peace cry if you must, but she said laugh too. And Dwight Palmer says a member of our church needed assistance to go to the doctor. Once I contacted immediately, the spirit of Christ said, Dwight, go and do it and take him. So I love, I love that people are listening to the Holy Spirit. And, you know, we, the Bible says, you know, little child, well, I shouldn't say the Bible says, but we all know that we can learn lessons from children. And actually in Jesus's ministry, he did a lot with the children. He said, suffer the little children to come unto me. One day, my children and I were in a restaurant and one of them said, mommy, we should pay for breakfast for this family over there. And I looked at the family and I said, oh, no, no, no. It was about a family of nine people. And the table was full of food. And I said, oh, no, no, no. But I said, nah, we got we to teach them the lesson. So I said, well, boys, why do you want to pick that family? Maybe we should pick the family, this little this man over here. And there was a single man sitting there. And he had a cup of a, probably coffee and a biscuit or something. And so, I, so the boy said, OK, mommy, but we think we should have done the big family. So I said, no, let's just do this guy over here. Now, I was being selfish, clearly, because the big family, I had no idea what their bill would be. But I also know it wasn't the time 
when I had a lot of money in my account. So I, I was like, Ooh, I don't know if I can do this. Long story short, <laughs> the man, we, we didn't want anyone to know we had done it. And the backdrop of that story is someone had done it for us like two, three weeks before that. So we were paying it forward. And the man, um, when I got out to pay, the total was extremely high. And I'm thinking, okay, I know what my family just had. What, where did this total come from? When the man learned that someone was paying for him, he went on to order breakfast, lunch, and dinner and a pack to go home. <laughs> So God taught me a story, a lesson there, because if I had probably followed, I believe the Lord was speaking to the children to pay for that family. And in my selfishness, I wanted to, I wanted to do a good deed, but at my, you know, at what I wanted to spend, and that's not how God wants us to be. When he calls us to do something, he will equip us. So the, the joke and lesson learned was on me as well. And we can learn from children and learn from each other with these circumstances. And I'm sure you all have stories similar to that. And, and there are times when you do a good deed and it may backfire, but that's not, and the person may not even be grateful, but in the Bible, we see stories of that too, where Jesus healed lepers, leprosy, the outcast of the community. And nine of them went running and leaping, but one came back to thank God. One came back to thank Jesus. So we don't have to always get the praise and the accolades and the thank you, thank you, thank yous, because our reward is not on this earth. And the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. As we turn our eyes upon Jesus, that is our literal reward, is the joy we get from serving Jesus. And so that leads us to a conversation about what really matters to Jesus. What really matters? Cherie, can you read for us Matthew 25, 31 to 46? Yes. When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, he will sit on his glorious throne. All the nations will be gathered before him and he will separate the people one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. He will put the sheep on his right and the goats on his left. Then the king will say to those on his right, come, you who are blessed by my father, take your inheritance, the kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. For I was hungry and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger and you invited me in. I needed clothes and you clothed me. I was sick and you looked after me. I was in prison and you came to visit me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you something to drink? When did we see you a stranger and invite you in or needing clothes and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and go to visit you? The king will reply, truly I tell you, whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did for me. Then he will say to those on his left, depart from me, you who are, you who are cursed into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry and you gave me nothing to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me to drink. I was a stranger and you did not invite me in. I needed clothes and you did not clothe me. I was sick and in prison and you did not look after me. They also will answer, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or needing clothes or sick or in prison and did not help you? He will reply, truly I tell you, whatever you did not do for one of the least of these, you did not do for me. Then they will go away to eternal punishment but the righteous to eternal life. Wow, wow, definitely something to reflect on. Ooh, and that's the thrust. That is the thrust, the, the, the total message of God, Jesus and his ministry on earth. And when we talk about being like Jesus, being like Jesus, it's something summed up in the scripture passage that Cherie just read. So, Elder Baptiste, tell us what you think it means to be a genuine Christian. Yes. <clears throat> now, Christianity is not an act that you graduate from. <laughs> it's not one of the scholastic disciplines that you, um, within your own self, accomplish uh, great feats. Christianity simply means 
walking in the footsteps of Jesus, literally, quite literally, exactly where Christ placed his footsteps, you put your footstep in that precise footprint. It involves being empathetic. It involves being sympathetic. It involves being forgiven and all the disciplines that Christ exhibited. In other words, Paul himself, the prince of the apostles said, I have not achieved. In other words, Paul was still striving like us. Paul, imagine that. So it means that we have to daily depend upon God for the very virtues that differentiates us from others. The little, that, the little good that is in me, it's all because of Jesus. And it's all God's and not of me. Amen. 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 Um, Sonia? For me, genuine Christianity is found in the verse um, where Jesus expects to us to care for the destitute and anyone else that exhibits a need. We, to, we are to live our lives to be an example to others just as Jesus did by serving the underserved, I guess you would say, population. And with, by, by doing this, he met their needs and he met them where they were. Hmm. Amen. 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 Cherie? Um, I would agree with everything that's been said already. Um, Genuine Christianity to me is the way that we treat others yes. and, and um, learning to treat others with kindness, with love, with respect, with compassion, um, with e e equality, uh, forgiveness, generosity. And I could go on and on, but, but essentially exhibiting all the fruits of the spirit and all of the ways of Christ. Um, and asking for God's help. I mean, we can't, we obviously can't accomplish any of that without the Holy Spirit, without God living in us. But um, the way that we treat others, I think really reflects genuine Christianity. Mm -hmm. I agree. I agree. That's an excellent, excellent statement. So we've learned so much in our conversation together and we've had a lovely time talking about ministering like Jesus and what it means to be like Jesus. And so we have some other comments that have come from you out there who are watching and listening. Let's see here. Um, Joyce Hammond, Elder Joyce Hammond says, people are hurting and desperate for human touch. So as we greet others on the street, in the stores, we must pray that our touch must be filled with the Holy Ghost. Elder Hammond, that's a powerful comment. I recall being in line at a, a I think it, it was a store, not a store, one of the fast food places. I was getting some lemonade and it was an early in the morning. I was on my way to work and I said, I'm going to have some lemonade to have to sip throughout the day. And a woman walked by in front of my car and she gave me the biggest smile. And that thing hit me right in my chest. And I said, this was an elderly woman. And, and she was she was walking into this food place to work. And I was in my, when I saw her walking, she had a limp, she had, she was struggling, obviously trying to get to work at this fast food location. And I judged, I said, oh man, I'm so mad that she has to work. You get to their golden years and here you are having to work. There's something wrong. And I just went on and on in my mind, just upset that this woman had to work. Okay. As she walks in front of my car, she gives me the hugest smile that hit me in the soul. And it lit my day up to the point where I said, oh my goodness, is that what my smile can do for people? Is a smile that powerful? So when you can't say a word, you can smile. If you can't hug someone, you can smile. And that smile can light up the world and let people know that you are Christian. And they know we are Christians by the love that we show people. So Elder Hammond, thank you for that comment. Let's see. 
Uh, it says, Elder Cameron says, thank you, Elder Janine. You touched me so powerfully by your smile <laughs> <laughs> and positive attitude. Thank you, Elder Hammond. Uh, let's see here. Elder, someone says, Georgia says, Elder Hammond, something that I can do because it's natural. It's tell people good morning when I'm walking. I notice sometimes they're caught off guard, but I notice the change in their countenance. And um, Victoria says, that is my chapter. I live those verses daily. I live by Matthew 25. And um, we have our son, David, 17 year old, years old, has a big heart for others. He always gives what he has to the homeless on the streets. This summer, he and three other high school graduates bought several lunch meals from Taco Bell, got mm -hmm. chips, cold water with their own money, and headed right. to the streets of D.C. and served dinner as they enjoyed their rides on bikes. Blessed my soul to see youth genuinely give their few dollars to those in need. Mm -hmm. Wow, wow, wow. Very, very powerful, very powerful. And Jillian says, sacrificial love and service. We must be the hands and feet of Christ in the love of others. So there's powerful things going on and people are living out the mission of serving our neighbors, inviting them into a relationship with Jesus Christ and empowering them to reach others. So as we prepare to bring our discussion to a close, we're going to have our panelists give final thoughts in about a sentence or two about what it really means to minister like Jesus. Go ahead, Cherie. Uh, to minister to, to like Jesus, I think to sum it up, I would say we need to meet, learn to meet people where they are, uh, learn to be loving, to be kind, to give a smile, like you said, Janine, think of others before we think of ourselves and remember that Jesus loves everyone the same and he died for all of us. Um, when we, sometimes when I look at someone and I think, oh, Jesus loves them too. And Jesus died for them too. It helps me just to see them differently and my acts will follow. So that's what ministering like Jesus looks like to me. Amen. Amen. Sonia? To me, um, it shows compassion and quite simply, our actions speak louder than our words. And I'd like to leave you with this quote from uh, Mark Finley's book, Making Friends for God, on page 78. If we are going to be followers of Jesus, let's love as he loved, minister as he ministered, and serve as he served. Amen. 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 Elder Baptiste. Yes. I, my mom left me with some of her DNA genes. <laughs> and chief among them... Uh, is generosity. I remember when I was a kid, my mom used to send us to take food to those who did not have. She had a little shop and she gave the shop away quite literally. <laughs> That's a bad business practice. But she gave the shop away. And you know what? It was good. She invested in the bank of heaven. Christ said, because I was thirsty, because I was hungry and you fed me, because I was in prison and you clothed me, enter, joy, enter into the joy of my Lord. So my mom gave me that positive affirming spirit, which is dominant in me, and I am proud to exhibit it to all inhabitants of earth. Amen. 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 We hope you've enjoyed our discussion today from Ministering Like Jesus. And if this is the first time that you've stumbled upon the Seabrook channel here, we want you to know that Seabrook is a Bible-believing, Spirit-filled, Christ-loving congregation. And we'd love to you for you to be a part of our family. We certainly want you to stay tuned and join us for our 11 o'clock worship services, where our lead pastor, Pastor Damian Johnson will be giving a power-packed word that is that will definitely be something to transform your lives. 
Now, in order to be sure that you can stay tuned for that service, you'll have to refresh your browser because if you don't refresh your browser, the computer may not know that there's another service going on and you'll be sort of stuck in some loop. <laughs> and you don't want to be stuck in some spiritual loop. You want to be constantly moving forward and upward and higher. We also want to remind our members and, and family and friends that we have a church business meeting today at eight o'clock. And the one way to find out the link for that is to look at your newsletters that would have been emailed to you from our communications department, but I'm sure they'll be making a special announcement about it in the 11 o'clock service as well. And of course, we know that some of you are just sitting at home wondering, how can I be a part of the Sabbath School panel? And you're just itching and itching and saying, how can I be a part? How can I do more? I am so happy that you are out there wondering that question. It's very simple, friends. All you have to do is send an email to communications at seabrooksda.org and say in the sentence or the memo line that you would like more information of how you can be a part of the Sabbath School panel. And someone will reach out to you and get you connected with the various moderators. We hope that you have enjoyed your time studying in this reflective Bible study. We want to thank Elder Gabriel Baptiste, Dr. Sharique Caleb, and Mrs. Sonia Paul for, for their participation in this panel. And we will conclude with a, a prayer. Let us bow our heads and close our eyes. Dear Heavenly Father, as we turn our eyes upon you, we thank you for the example, the living example that you've given us through Jesus. We thank you for the time we've shared today, learning how we can minister and be more like Jesus. Help us to recognize that the things of earth are not the things that we should be placing our treasures in, but that we should be putting our efforts in love and our time and things that are leading us closer to you. Bless us this day, prepare our hearts, speak to us, remove any cobwebs that will keep us from he hearing or seeing the messages that you have for us. And may we continue to grow as a community, be with our family members who have lost loved ones who are, are mourning and suffering this morning. Send the Holy Spirit to guide and to comfort them. We thank you for Jesus. In his name we pray, amen. Amen. Go with God and walk with the King today. We'll see you next week. Same time. Be blessed.